Welcome to the post-screening discussion of Matter Out of Place by Nikolaus Geihalter, competing in the Concours Internationale of the 75th Locarno Film Festival. I'm happy to have here with us Nikolaus Geihalter, the film's director, Michael Kitzberger, the film's producer, Sofia Lagna, the assistant director, Samira Garemani, editor, Sergei Martiniuk, uh, responsible for sound, Silvia Borna from the PR Nikolaus Geihalter film, and Antonia Bernkopf, the production manager. Um, if you need translation, uh, there is um, headphones at the back, and there is French translation uh, available. Uh, quite, quite directly, Nikolaus, can we start just by discussing the title, Matter Out of Place? You gave us a definition very early in the film. Is this a term, where does the term come from? Yeah, I mean, actually, we, we ran across this term at the Burning Man Festival because they use it when they clean up. Mm -hmm. And um, they use it in a wider sense. It's not only trash, it's anything that wasn't there before, shouldn't be there after. And that's what I liked because, I mean, yes, it is a film about trash, but it's a film about much more. And it's a film about what we do to the planet and what we leave behind. So, and they did not invent it. It is a, it, it is a kind of term that is used a little bit in the, in the outdoor scenes or when you go hiking, you, should, you shouldn't leave anything. But basically, um, yeah, I think the, the guys who use it most nowadays are the guys at the Burning Man Festival. Mm -hmm. And uh, the film takes us to various locations around the world. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your research process and how you picked the locations. Yeah, I mean, about the research, maybe Sophia can tell us more. In, in the end, you know, it's, there is an idea, and there are images in my mind that I want to find, or, what the, the, or locations that I know I want to have in the movie. And then, then it's, it's a process of shooting the first location, starting to edit, still researching any more, any further. And it, it's really growing like this. And um, yeah, I mean, some locations uh, were easier to find, others were less easy to find. But it was not so much about the specific location sometimes. It was more about um, places that are not so usually seen in the cinema and that are, people don't want to see because they don't, want, don't have a closer look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, um, we needed to get there. And, and it's, that's how I, how I understand documentary filmmaking, actually, too to enable the audience to, to get access to, to areas they wouldn't usually get to. And so this order, the order that we visit these places, that wasn't predetermined, that, was, that came uh, during the edit? Yeah, of course, I mean, that's, you know, it's like, it's all growing. And the very first concept of the movie was very, very different to what we see now. Um, this is a kind of, a freedom that we have when we are working, that in the end, I mean, there is a topic, and in the end, there must be a film that works, and nobody cares what was written in the initial papers. Mm -hmm. Because I know that very often documentaries, they are kind of scripted till the very end, and then when you get the funding, you just have to try to film exactly what you were writing before. And, and But, you know, reality is different. Things are changing. So 
you have to keep, keep open eyes and ears and, 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 and adapt to reality permanently. Mm -hmm. If there's any questions from the audience, feel free to raise your hand and um, we'll get a, a microphone to you. Uh, there's one at the very back. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for that film. That's not a question, but the question com comes now. Um, you chose to uh, end the movie with the Burning Man event. Uh, which is kind of a, it's an event, it's not every day's life. Um, what determined that choice compared to all the situations that you explore? Yeah, you know, the Burning Man. Um, I mean, I know, I knew in the beginning that I wanted to include it in the movie because they're really cleaning up the desert very well. And it's actually that the process of cleaning up takes much, much longer than the festival or the event or, or, event or whatever you call it. And, um, what was also clear that this is not going to be the classical movie about trash where somebody tells you so many tons of waste are produced and this is the problem and this is how we're going to solve it or not going to solve it. It's more like a tree that is growing and growing and growing and um, there are different branches and some are obvious, some are not so obvious and it was very clear as obvious that, that um, this Burning Man episode would be a very strange one. But in the end, and also in the end of the movie, and this is why it is sitting there, it is like a very strange, funny look at human beings with a glimpse in the eye, you know? So that's what I like about it. It's not only another location where we are producing a lot of trash and then cleaning it up again. It's like a little bit of a parable. It's like, a, some call it a utopia, I, I wouldn't call it like this, but I think after seeing a lot of trash that people produce, it is a, a nice way to look at people, actually. Who are we on this planet? What are we doing here? And mirroring ourselves at an event like this, I think, raises a lot of questions which are good. Any other questions over here in the front? Um, I have a question. I was sort of missing to know um, where the different scenes took place at. But now I understand you did this on purpose because it could be anywhere. And is that the meaning? Why you didn't let people know where you took the different scenes? True. I mean, you know, some, some scenes are very specific, like Burning Man. Everybody knows where it is. And other scenes, like a big trash dump or an incinerator plant or something like this could be anywhere and it really doesn't matter where it is so much. For those who want to know, it is in the credits in the end. But if we would have put these credits during the movie, it would have raised a lot of questions. Why do they go to this place and not to this place? Why do they go, why do they travel the world in this direction and, and all this kind of stuff. But it doesn't matter because the whole world is struggling with the same problems and basically technology is more or less the same everywhere. So we found it's, it's, it's more interesting for the flow to not answer all these questions. Some of them, some of them locations, they, are, they get answered during the episode anyway, like Albania and so on. Yeah? But, but it, other than that, it, it doesn't matter because it's just, you know, it's, it's everywhere. Um, further question in the front there? Uh, you show different ways to g get rid of the, all the garbage, no? So burning, putting under the earth. But you didn't dedicate any image to recycling. Finally, there are some places where garbage is recycled and reused. So now there are some solutions that are going on. So it's because you are not optimistic or or you are not, uh, you don't think these ways of recycling are not effective? Because we, in, for example, I am coming from Italy, I, I we are try to divide, and you in Switzerland even more. You divide all the garbage, and you are you trust that all what you divide will be reused, will will be we will have uh, uh, a purpose. Uh, so we are all. Uh, now feel better about the, all this garbage in, in some ways? Yes, but I mean, 
And it, actually, there was a recycling plant in the movie. This is where all these bags, where the plastic was recycled. But you know, what I learned shooting this movie is that whatever we produce ends up as trash and will never ever go away, except food which rottens, you know? And if we recycle a bottle of plastic two or three times, at some point it will still end up as a trash. If we recycle a glass, of course we have to do it, and it will have a second and a third and maybe 20 lives, but in the end it ends up as a trash. If we bury it, it will be there forever. If we burn it, it will be less material in the end, but you see it in the end, there is big piles of, of what is left from the process of incineration, which is left forever. So I didn't want to to, to give you too much hope about recycling. We have to do this, and we are good people if we recycle, but we are even better people if we don't use so much materials, you know? And um, what starts when you put the trash into the different trash pins is a huge, huge machinery and, and, and the business, actually, which has a, a very, very big CO2 print in the end, because all the materials, they are collected, they are brought to one plant, they are brought to a next plant, and, and if you, for example, if you take the glass and if you make a, if you reuse the glass, yes, it is good, but it takes nearly as much fuel or energy like producing a new glass. The same with aluminium. So it is a little, it is a kind of a dream of our society. If we recycle everything, it doesn't cost anything. It is not true. It is, of course, better, but it's much, much better to try to reduce. And I'm not better than you regarding this. I produce a lot of waste, but we have to know that basically what we do is problematic. <laughs> Uh, further questions? At the back. Uh, I wanted to know how you work with the sound. Perhaps uh, how much is uh, post production? And yeah. I can tell you that um, to, to, to enable you to become part of the scenery, it takes these wide angle shots, which have a length, a, 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 quite, a, quite a long length, and, and which have a lot of details. and very important is the accurate sound. So um, I really love sound as much as image, and that's why I work with guys like Sergey, for example, who take care of that, and I think you can tell better. Well, basically, we knew from the beginning that we will want to produce a big one, uh, and also knew that there will be no mu not, not much of the dialogue you know, explaining things. So we wanted to explain as much as possible with picture and with, with the sound as well. So we, we used uh, basically a surround recording on the, on the set, uh, and additionally to the conventional, conventional one. And of course, it took a lot of effort to, you know, to put it all on, on the stuff, especially you know, all, all the garbage cans and stuff like that. So yes, it was, it was a lot of location sound, and we, the, the thing you hear in, this, in the cinema is, um, well, it is real. Sometimes we, we did some, some tricks, of course, uh, but most of the time this is what we wanted to hear like on the location. And of course we, we do a lot of things in post-production to, um, yeah, to make it even uh, more um, you know, understandable. Maybe what, what I also want to say is that when you go to the cinema nowadays, usually you watch feature films that you have a perfect design sound. You hear whatever you see. And this is kind of a standard that you expect. And this is where we try to get with the documentary, too. I mean, most of the sound record in location. And if we didn't catch it, we try to fix it in post-production, sometimes even with Foley, sometimes with extra sound recordings, just to, to have the audience in the flow. Because if it would be missing, there would be something wrong, and the, and the film would probably stop working, you know? It's not only about me being perfectionist about the sound and you, it's also about really the story that nothing should distract you and nowadays a sound which is not perfect is a distraction. Further questions at the very back? Um, it goes to anyone that wants to answer. How has the process of making this film affected your way of consuming and dealing with trash and garbage? or people in your surrounding. <laughs> uh, so, um, I would say 
in terms of how I use um, things and how I throw things away, it didn't really change much because already before that I was a bit conscious about it and trying not to produce too much waste. But um, for, for me, the, the experience of, um, of, of spending days, hours or days on this piles like fields or, or mountains of garbage um, and feeling that I don't trust the, the ground below my feet um, because I don't want to fall and uh, this is very, it's very unstable. Um, made, yeah, I don't know, it changed something for me about thinking about the ground below our feet, even on other places, because obviously on the landfill, um, you, you know that you're standing on all kinds of different things that you don't want to stand on. But uh, yeah, those things are almost everywhere, even if you don't see it. So um, we were observed or we, we, we visited places where people are cleaning up, but still I had the impre impression that um, this place is a huge mess, <laughs> the whole place. So yeah. Other question at the back? Um, thank you for your film, first of all. Um, my question sort of, I, I wanted to ask d more into the process and style of deciding the, the, the visual style of the story because, I, I mean, I can smell it <laughs> during, during watching the film. And I believe a lot of people walking into the screening just now are all aware deeply about the issue of plastic. It's not a new topic, but... Um, I guess, but but when you keep on watching the repeatedly of the processors and you know people dumping or picking it up, it's not a new material or topic to deal with. So I wonder, um, was there discussion that went on in preparation or in the edits to determine like you know like how much is how much goes into the, the, the edits, and also like why keeping that style? Was that a central message that you were hoping to be consistently carried out? Does that? <laughs> I'm not sure if I got all of the questions right. I mean, the style, to be honest, the answer is very simple. This is the way I make films. <laughs> this is the way I see the world, and this is my style of filmmaking. And I absolutely do not have the feeling that I have any answers. So if you have a lot of questions now, that's basically what this film is to achieve. This is not a call to action movie, you know? It is a film that shows the state of what we do at the moment. And um, I'm not sure about the question. What was, or there was something about the editing, but is there anything to add? No, I guess, like, you said it briefly the, for the first question that you wanted the message to be basically questioning, like, matter out of place, who we are. Maybe we're the matter that's out of place. Like, the question that you're, you're trying to, like, post in this film. So I wonder, like, in accordance to answering that question or explore that question, like, is, what, what was the process like deciding the style of the visuals? Well, the style of the visuals is decided immediately on the location. I mean, so basically the process is we, we search for locations, we go there, shoot some of them, and start editing, and research for another location, and uh, this, is, this, is, this wheel is turning until we have to finish, more or less. And on the location, I mean, I, you know, I prefer the wide angle shots, I prefer the sometimes elevated location of the camera to see this whole scenery. I prefer shots that have a a long breath, because it's just my way of filmmaking. It is basically a film about environment. It's a film about what we do to the environment and how we, how we treat it. And um, it's probably just a choice of filmmaking. It's, it's my choice. I think this is the answer. And I, and I think just one thing, um, how it affects like uh, the, re the, the research is that um, we have to find places which are as much as possible, I mean, not completely, but as far as possible, we find images which are, to a certain extent, um, self-explanatory. Um, 
Um, so, so the kind of the, 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 the way of filming also um, uh, guides how to research for places and how to decide which places we choose and which places might be interesting in the story, but not um, in terms of the images that we find there. Therefore, you need kind of a parallel editing so that we see what's there already and, and they can change their kind of research. And yeah, so it all happens parallel and um, is discussed. So, a question here. Thank you for the film. I just want, would like to know how you manage to be cameraman and filmmaker. The first question, and the second, are there um, locations you filmed which are not in the film? <laughs> yeah, the first question is easy to answer. You know, my background is photography, and usually I really know what I want. When I go to a scenery, I know how to shoot it, and I know exactly how what I want, and then sometimes we have to organize some letters or some cherry pickers or whatever equipment to get the camera on this exact position, but it's just my way of working. So for me, it's easier to do it myself than to discuss with some camera operator, because this person wouldn't be happy. I'm too stubborn. <laughs> really, I, I, I'm kind of, me and the camera, this goes pretty quickly, and sometimes we're faster than the sound. That's true. <laughs> And um, yes, locations, I mean, for example, one location that we really, one location, the coolest location was, was the outer space. We were always working on, on an episode about um, trash in the, in the space. But this was impossible to, 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 to finish because it was, there were so many organizations involved in this. And again, with my language of filmmaking, I mean, we couldn't fly to space. And whatever is going on is going on in front of monitors or with some, some devices trying to track down some, some space debris. So it was just not enough material for, for one really self-explaining episode, for example. So this is, but this is the one that I would have missed. Basically, what Nick is saying is that there is no sound, sound in space, so that's what we did. <laughs> <laughs> Question over there. Yes, I love your your film, and it's very informative, although you have no text in it. You only have basically images. And, but I was also wondering whether you had a, some kind of artistic uh, mindset while making or editing the movie, um, because some of the pictures are really beautiful. <laughs> and I was wondering whether you had a trade-off between the choice of images. Some might be too beautiful, or maybe they're only beautiful to me. But I found that the way of framing and the length of these uh, pictures were very fascinating. And uh, I was wondering whether you had some uh, self-awareness about these pictures that you took and edited. Um, yeah, I mean, film may be beautiful, you know? And um, of course, this is something that I'm permanently thinking about when, when we're working. It's, it's a question that usually comes. Is, is it legal to make beautiful images of an ab ugly topic, you know? And then usually I refer to, for example, this World Press Photography Awards, which is the same thing. You have a, basically you have a beautiful photograph of something really bad. And, um, but this is how the world works, and this is how aesthetics works, and the aesthetic draw you into something, and if you want the film to work, you have to work with aesthetics. And this is, actually a cool process also for the audience, because sometimes you think it's, it's, it's the same, it's beautiful and ugly, and this is what we do and what we are, you know? But, I mean, it doesn't make sense not to present a good photography when you make a movie. Further questions at the back over there? Thank you for your movie. <coughs> I have one question. I'm here. Where? No, oh, here. Oh, yeah. oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have one question. It struck me that the beginning, the beginning and the end was with text, spoken text, and the middle was without. Was this on purpose? Because you wanted to have the pictures speaking to 
the to the, the person watching the movie, or was this just by chance? You just didn't want to put any text in the middle of the movie. Uh, it was by chance. Uh, I think that whatever is necessary to tell the story um, goes in. So in the beginning, it's just uh, necessary that um, uh, that's the episode in Switzerland with the excavator um, uh, taking out the, the garbage out of the earth. Uh, it's just necessary um, that this episode is in front and it happens that they talk about what they're doing. And this is also like the way that the audience or, or we understand what happens in there. Um, but I, I get some footage and I, I have um, the feeling Nick just uh, put a camera there and uh, someone recorded the sound and um, yeah, it, it goes in whatever tells the story. So, and um, for the episodes afterwards, for example, it's not necessary that there is any spoken word, first of all, and the second is also it uh, just didn't happen. On the, one, on the one hand, like there is no interview necessary, for example. In the beginning, we had a lot of interviews. And then we realized, OK, um, the story is much better told when no one is explaining what happens. Um, because the audience has the ability to make so much of a, of a bigger association about what happens worldwide and what people, what society does. Um, that And, and uh, just... Um, you know, a, an interview here and there wouldn't cover uh, what you can associate in your mind about, you know, seeing seeing the the bigger the bigger thing. <laughs> uh, I, I hope I answered the question. When I first came to the uh, cutting room, I saw uh, a piece of paper and it said something like, "Correct me if I'm wrong." It said something: "Don't explain, show." <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's show, don't tell. <laughs> show, don't tell. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. If there's a question from the floor, over here. Well, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Gary Halter, for this, another devastating movie. <laughs> You're welcome, <laughs> always. And indeed, I wanted to ask, I mean, I know the other one especially, is like Earth, of course, kind of in relationship to this movie. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think about your own work and what is the thoughts that you have between each other? How much hope do we have to produce in movies? How much answers, not answers, but at least giving a perspective that we gotta get out of this shit. And it was really devastating. I was sitting in the movie, as probably a lot of people here with uh, open mind, open mouth. But I'm, of course, destroyed in some way. Even if you put the, the bizarre uh, Burning Man festival at the very end. So let me know a little, little bit about your thoughts, how we should work as filmmakers with the issue of hope and perspective. Thanks. Well, to be honest, if you want to hear something about hope, <laughs> I don't think I can give you the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, Thinking it to the very end, we all produce trash, we all produce CO2, we know about climate change, we know that whatever we do, every breath we take has causes a problem. The most environmentally friendly way of living is basically not to live at all, but this is nothing we would agree on. So we will keep on struggling and keep on hoping, but I'm not making the kind of movies to give you hope. <laughs> On that note, thank you very much for sharing and discussing your film with us, and thank you all for coming.